October the 12th, 2014. So good morning to the English class. Right? The little group, right? Um, yeah. So uh, good morning to Becerra de Meneses. We're at Spiritist Center. I think everybody here. Anybody new? Oh, <laughs> all right. So here we go. We're uh, we're on uh, YouTube, um, where you can see the gospel according to uh, Spiritism, and Sunday 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Uh, and it's a broadcasted live on YouTube. So that's great. Today's reading is from our book, Our Daily Bread, by uh, Francisco Candido Javier, by the Spirit Emmanuel, Chapter 143. Do not Tyrannize. <coughs> With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the words to them as much as they could understand. In the dissemination of the evangelical teachings, every now and then we encounter preachers who are strict and demanding. Such an anomaly is not only seen in the general service, in the personal sphere, it is not uncommon to see the severe and fervent friends who desperately demand that the followers be in tune with the religious principles that they embrace. Harsh discussions arise touching off bitter speeches. Beautiful emotional expressions are shaken in their foundations due to improper offenses. However, if the descent was truly controlled by his determination to be united with the master, such an attitude can be easily corrected. The master would only speak to those who listen as much as they could understand. To the apostles, he conferred instructions of an elevated symbolic value, while to the multitude he transmitted fundamental truths by the way of simple stories. His speech varied according to the spiritual needs of those who gathered around him. He absolutely never became exasperated with anyone's personal position. If you are in service to the Lord, consider the indispensable requirements of elimination as the world is in dire need of Christian workers and not of doctrine, doctrinaire tyrants. Very true. So that's, that's good to reflect on. For reflection about today's reading, in today's reading, Emmanuel reminds us the same way. Jesus spoke just to the ones who listened as much as they could understand. We should also speak according to the spiritual needs of those who surround us without any imposition. Do I have the patience for the brothers and sisters? Who still do not understand the gospel as much as I do? Do I practice Jesus' teachings in my daily life so I can be an example to those around me? That's uh, something we always forget. You know, sometimes we have uh, maybe a little bit more understanding than others, so we have to be patient. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's close our eyes, relax our shoulders, and say a prayer. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for giving us the knowledge that the spirit teachings provide us. Thank you for being a constant inspiration in all our lives. May the light of your message and your heart and your love fill our minds and our souls with charity, love, and understanding. Amen. So, yeah, let it be, right? Let it be. So today, and, uh, today our speaker is Alan Sanabria, and he's going to speak to us about St. Francis of Assisi, a true role model. So our good brother, uh, Alan, thank you, sir. Here. Thank you very much. Good morning, good day to everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So before I start uh, going into the speech, um, today was originally supposed to be a one-time speech about St. Francis. But while we're reading and rereading and listening to the audio book and studying other books, I realized that you cannot cram St. Francis into one speech, into 45 minutes or 30 minutes. Um, his, his life was extraordinary. His teachings were extraordinary. And the life experience that he went through it's very extraordinary for us to understand the life. For those of you who know St. Francis, before I read much about him, all I knew he was a saint. I love animals, nature. Um, but after studying about him, 
I realized that there's much more to this man. Even though his love for God and Jesus was simple, his beginnings weren't. He came from a wealthy family. A father who sold cloth for a living and was one of the wealthiest patricians of Assisi. He was somebody who the women adored. He was an artist. He loved to sing, to dance, to have fun. He didn't have a care in the world. But he had these dreams of being a knight, being someone of extreme importance, somebody to give back. But he didn't think about Jesus nor God. He just wanted to be somebody important. So once the war between Assisi and I forgot the name of the other Italian state came about, he was more than willing to go to war for glory. Not for anything else, just to be somebody in news, right? And during when he went to war, Assisi lost horribly. Most of the, all the men were killed, except the men of wealth. How did they know this? Because the wealthy men of Assisi, they were the, the ones that thought they were so-called knights, had the bright, shiny armor, bright, shiny clothes. So those people were allowed to live. During that time, St. Francis was in prison for one year, waiting for his father's ransom. So, during that one year, he had a lot of time to reflect. But it wasn't until he returned back to Assisi when his life changed. As you see a picture of him, again, that's the way I associated with him before I even studied about him. Somebody who loved animals and nature. But I would start off this speech with a prayer from him. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, harmony. Where there is error, truth. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. So as beautiful as that prayer is, it seems like our brother Francis knew about spiritual life. Here's a poem from the Franciscan order by the medieval Franciscan poet Jacopone da Todi. Poverty is to have nothing. And to desire nothing is to possess everything in a spirit of freedom. In that few sentences of a poem describes what it is to be a Franciscan. For they wanted to live a humble life of poverty, the, the way of Jesus, the way of lady poverty. And by desiring nothing and having nothing, but having spiritual liberty, spiritual freedom, Love in Jesus and God in everything. They possess everything. So let's start off with a dream. One night in the CC after he returned from the prison, he couldn't sleep. So about, I would say, 6 a.m. in the morning. He was, during his dream, he was led into the great hall of a dazzling palace where a radiant princess bride held court. The walls were covered with shields and trophies of battles won. And when he asked aloud who the lord of the castle was, a voice sang out, It is the high court of Francis Bernardoni and his followers. So for those you don't know, his real name is Francesco Bernardoni. Now, how many of us have dreams all the time? Sometimes we have nightmares, sometimes we have dreams that we're some famous person or that we're going to do something great. But... A lot of times we translate dreams to literal. Sometimes we're like, no, nah, we're going crazy, right? <laughs> when Francis awoke, something had changed. It was not the message of the dream that moved him so, 
not the announcement that he was going to be a great Lord. No, it was the fact of the dream that it had happened, that he now had a sense of direction, something to live for. There was certainty about his dream, like that of a vision. Now, I'm not sure about everyone else, but I can speak for myself and say that when I, had, when I felt I had no purpose, I felt lost. And I think I could speak for most of us on earth that without a purpose, we're not sure what direction to take, where to go, what to do, how to get there. And our brother Francis, who's one of the most respected saints on earth, had the same doubts. Even had the dream been of Francis losing his money and position and becoming a beggar, it would have pleased him because then he would at least have known which way to go. A sense of goal and purpose were more important, it seemed, than what direction he was going in. Maybe it had something to do with his own worth or who he was. But most of all, it meant that he was going somewhere and anywhere. I mean, it's beautiful to know when you have that goal. Many of us can live our entire life without having that goal. And because we don't have that goal, we actually cause our own suffering because we feel lost. And we're hoping one day something, someone, somewhere, God may show us that goal. But sometimes that goal is too hard for us to comprehend. And sometimes we're shown that goal and we deny it because we're scared. His will was no longer paralyzed. The dream had freedom from his own frozen will. So Francis determined to make his dream come true. Knowing that with setting out that mattered, he remembered so clearly his lightness of heart, and as he left Assisi to join the papal armies of Walter, again I might add, of Brienne, the Norman captain who was winning brilliant battles in the service of Pope Innocent III. So he went to battle once, he was captured, sent back home. Now because of this vision he had that seemed like a reality, and he took the message literally. He says, I'm gonna go back to war again. This is what God wants me to do. Right? Now, if, if we took some of our dreams literally, I wonder where we would be today. <laughs> now, now, the title of this one is not what he thought. On the way with the army to battle, he had a vision again. And here's what the, the conversation was with Jesus. Jesus said, Francis, is it better to serve the Lord or the servant? Francis said, oh, sir, the Lord, of course. And Jesus said, well, why are you trying to turn your Lord into a servant? Mm -hmm. And then Francis said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Jesus said, go home, Francis, and think about your first vision. You have seen only the appearances and not the heart of glory and fame. You are trying to make your vision fit your own impatient desire for life. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wow, how deep is that? That we we see a, a dream, a vision out of body, and we want to translate it to what it means to our ego. Right? We feel lost, we're given a path. And then that path, we turn it to our ego. I could relate to this. I mean, when I was doing this speech, I kept thinking about myself in so many different ways. And like, wow, how I messed up, how I think how I took things to little sense. Right? But that's why when we do receive a dream, a vision, a friendly conversation with a friend that sparks an idea in our head, sometimes we need to take a step back and not take it so literal. So let's talk about the rebirth of Francis. Not at the spiritual that he died and came back to earth, but the rebirth of who he was at that moment. The time from where Francis, fancy, girl-loving, rich boy, to the beginning of his transformation mm -hmm. into a brother who loved. During these long, terrifying months, Francis used to go to a little cave in the hill opposite Mount Subasi and try to think out what was happening to him. He went to the cave every day until it became a home for him, the only place in which he felt comfortable. Now, today we can't go to caves, right? We can't find any caves in Florida, unless you guys know some that I don't. <laughs> but we can meditate. We can find a happy place. And that's what Francis was trying to do because he was trying to hear his thoughts. 
if you haven't realized by now, Francis was a medium, right? Yes, we're all mediums, but he actually heard the spirit, right? Mm -hmm. But he needed to drown out the voices that he heard all day, every day, not just from the people, but in himself. So he went seeking solitude. How many of us don't want people around us because we can't think straight, mm -hmm. right? Because we're seeking that cave that Francis sought out. Too bad we don't live in Italy in the mountains, right? But we could try. Put a nice little headset on with some classical music and go to your own cave. It was in the cave that Francis met Jesus and saw himself for the first time. Up to that time, his voices and dreams always seemed to come from without, from a great distance. But during the agonizing hours in the cave, he began to hear a voice inside himself, a deeper, clearer voice that was like discovering a part of himself he did not know was there. The more he prayed and turned to Christ for inspiration, the deeper he plunged towards some inner force that gave him strength and peace. Now, when I read that, the first time didn't really catch me. This is the third time that I really said, wow. So imagine you hear a voice, let's say of a spirit, that's telling you about yourself, it's telling you that you need to change. And then you go into this meditation every day. And then you start doing some inner search of yourself. And then you realize, wow, oh, I have sinned. And, but since you're in this cave, you're in this solitude, you start speaking to Jesus, to his protector, to your mentor, to whoever you feel comfortable with. And you start letting go of those sins, asking forgiveness, looking for that change. And that's what Francis did in that cave every day. Looking back to today, to yesterday, and trying to change who he was. At the first, at first, the inner search was a painful and terrifying look at himself, at his weakness and sinfulness, and the journey was a downward dive that made him feel that he was drowning in some vast bottom of the lake. Now, any, if every one of us were to just look back this entire lifetime, would you cry the sins you committed? Would you cry to the people you hurt, to the offendful things that you said? And then not, not to imagine since we're our spirits, we believe in past lives. Imagine we even look, we felt even further. But guess what? Our brother Francis had the courage. You see that? That's a big thing, right? He had the courage to do this. It takes courage to look back into life. It takes courage to look into who you are, to what you have done, and ask forgiveness. That's why it's not simple. That's why it's not easy. That's why living the life of the gospel is not easy. That's why being a spiritist truly isn't easy. Because you can study, but if you don't practice, then what are you doing? If you're not changing who you are, then what are you doing? If you're not putting a reform to who you are, then what are you doing? Well, Brother Francis realized that and fought through it. But as he persevered in prayer, he came at last to something like a great, silent, waterproof cavern in which the sound of his own voice seemed mellow and deep. And there, at death within, Jesus spoke softly to him and made his heart burn with love. Look at that. So once he retreated, found all his sins, and finally became one with what he has done, continued praying as for Jesus, he finally let go of that pain of the past. And now he could hear Jesus clear. But how can we hear a spirit of such enlightenment? How can we hear any of our guardian angels if all we're surrounded by is pain from within ourselves? See, we're surrounded by our friends every day, our guardian angels, friends who want to help us spiritually and physically. But how can we hear or begin to comprehend or begin to understand if we don't first acknowledge the pain that we cause and then ask forgiveness for it and get past it? During that whole year, after hearing the voice of Christ at Spoleto, Francis went to the cave outside of Sisi and tried to bring that inner cave peace to the surface permanently. So he did not want to leave that cave until he actually felt that, hey, I'm going to go back outside. I could actually go outside and start helping people and not feel scared anymore, not fear my inner self. 
The search for the cabin would be his daily journey for the rest of his life. And if he was to be at peace, he will have to delve deeply in prayer every day. I just even our brother Francis, God bless you. Even our brother Francis, as good as he was, he knew he was a sinner. You know, an interesting fact about him was he did not like anyone, and I mean anyone calling him good. Do not call me good, I am a sinner. He actually was offended by anyone calling him good. Because he said out loud, you don't know my thoughts. You don't know what I've done. I am a sinner. That thought gave him great joy because he had to come to love the quest and the fear and the anticipation as part of the whole process of praying and listening to Christ. So he knew when he went to that cave, that was his moment alone with Christ. That was his moment where he got to repair who he was. And once he bathed himself with forgiveness, then he was able to hear clearly his friend, his brother, his master, Jesus. So look at this. This is a picture that I got from Googling about in Italy and the, on the caves or where they lived. They used to live in these caves, the brothers of the Franciscan Brotherhood. Imagine back then, us living in caves, raining cold outside. <coughs> Must be men together. That's pretty bad, huh? <laughs> I know one day when I was showering, I don't, I don't smell too well. <laughs> um, loneliness and happiness. Now, Imagine you find Christ, you find your new motivation, but you have no one to share with. Your father at this moment of time has, has completely disowned you because you're not going to be a wealthy business owner like him. You're embarrassed him on the streets because you're walking around preaching the word of God. And nobody is there with you. Your friends, the woman who used to like you, are like, no way, this guy is scary. <laughs> so, this is the hardest part. I know, like many of us, when you go to Spiritism, if you tell anybody you're Spiritist, oh man, those close friends are like, mm. <laughs> have a good day. <laughs> we don't want to know about you anymore. Right? Mm -hmm. And especially if you told them you're a working medium, <laughs> have a good day. <laughs> See you next slide. Exactly. So imagine our brother Francis, rich and wealthy, now on the streets, poor and humble, poor and humble asking for help. They, they, they thought he was a lunatic. What would you think? Right? If you had a son that, that he had everything, and suddenly he's on the streets begging for money, you'd be calling the psychiatric boy, wouldn't you? Francis, shaking loose from his boyhood companions, Resembled a pathetic leader, self-exile, self that's a key point here, self-exile, from his people. He stood at the corners of streets and spied around buildings at the carefree life of his former days. Now, that has to be hard, right? Because even though we are here today together, before coming here, or during the coming here, you wanted to talk to people about it, didn't you? How many of you could actually talk to somebody else about this? Could really say what you were feeling without being pushed away without being made fun of. So you, so it's, it, it's not, I don't want to say the word funny, but isn't it ironic that when you start doing that inner transformation, the people around you want to push you away? So it makes that inner transformation that much harder. Alone on evenings especially, he yearned to return and discard his dreams as the illusions of an ambitious and frustrated idealist. But just as he would start toward his former companions, a panic would clutch at his heart, and he was throwing away some jewel or treasure of incomparable beauty and value, and he couldn't do it. See, that is scary right there, because even today, the book, is, the book of the spirits, the book of mediums, they all tell you to be careful of fanaticism. Because fanaticism can lead to what? Obsession. Can lead to the destroyer of oneself. But that, that, then he considered for that because no one else was doing what he was doing. Right? But he, said, he, he knew inside he couldn't quit no matter what anybody else thought about him. Not his own father, not his friends. Mm -hmm. He still decided I'm going to do it. 
And he could be indeed destroying himself, but he felt that he wasn't. So he decided to continue. Now that's called being having courage and being brave. Now, how many of us could do that? How many of us could say that we have his will doing the right thing and everyone else around us is saying we're doing the wrong thing? So what do we do? Most of us are going to say, okay, well, they're telling us it's wrong, so I guess I got to do what they say because they know better than I do. But Francis had the courage to do otherwise. One day, walking down the hills of Assisi, he walked into the colony of lepers, and by intense impulse, he kissed and hugged the first leper he saw. He never felt freer in his life until that moment. Now, before that moment, let me explain to St. Francis, just I think as many of us would, probably even myself, I think I would too, see a leper, the smell, the stench, the look, would probably make you either throw up, walk away, or run away. Which St. Francis' original reaction before this moment was to do that. And these lepers were put into a colony far away from the main town. But when he got there, he felt that impulse. That he had to hug and kiss this leper. Now, many of us would have the impulse and be like, no, 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 no. Right? Because it was like, because what happens? Our inner body, our, our, our selfishness will make us stop. But again, he listened to that inspiration that he was getting. See, listening to the inspiration is not easy. And that's what I hope that you get from this speech today is that everything Francis did was not easy. But through inspiration, he was able to accomplish this. That kiss, that reaching out of the lips directed his heart for the first time towards someone worth loving other than himself. Wow, that's deep. He had a father. He had women who loved him. He had a mother who adored him. So he had love around him. But most of us love ourselves so much that we can't see beyond ourselves or beyond our kids. Right? Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, as spiritists, we're all brothers and sisters. We're all mothers and fathers of each other. But we can never get past our immediate family, our immediate love. Francis was able to through the inspiration of Jesus. I'm preparing my church. One day, after he already helped the leper, and continuously from that day on, helped the lepers, bathed them, washed them, clothed them, built huts for them. He felt, well, what next? Well, what do I do now? You know, like, this is it. So, at San Damiano Church, a broken down church, after driven by the inner force, he fell on his knees and began to pray intensely. Francis said, Lord Jesus, what do you want me to do? Every day I question my dream of Spoleto and wonder whether or not it was really you who spoke to me, or whether it was just my excitement about my coming baptism on fire as a knight. Lord, my dreams plague me so. What do they mean? What do I have such dreams and voices? What kind of man am I, Lord? So look, he heard the, the, the vision he had that one night. He continued helping out everybody he can. He gave away everything he owned because he felt Jesus was, gu was guiding him. But still, look at this. After all the time, he still wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. He still kind of like, because Think about it. That inner transformation that you're doing, again, people around you will continue to judge you. And it's going to make you second guess what you're doing, who you are, what, why you're doing. I know that, again, I can relate to this. And when I first started realizing I was a medium, a lot of bad things and good things happen. But I used to ask a question like that all the time. And then when you ask somebody else, they look at you like you're crazy or you're doing something wrong. And that feeling is horrible. That feeling is the worst feeling. That when you go looking for help, the people that you thought were there to help are kind of bringing you down a notch again. And that's exactly how he felt. Jesus replied, replied, Francis, go now and prepare my church, which as you see is falling down. 
Now, how many of you want to make a bet that Francis did exactly, literally, what that meant? <laughs> he exactly started collecting bricks and mortar, begging for bricks all over the town, and started repairing churches. Because he took exactly what that, 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 that thought. Mm -hmm. Repairing my church, okay. Find every broken down church I could find and go prepare them. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. As you see, that's a dream. This is actually a, a portrait of one of the churches in, in Italy. Right? He's praying in front of the, the crucifix. And he got his vision. And that's him repairing the church. Now, obviously, Jesus did not meant that. But he probably appreciated that when he prepared the churches. But that's not exactly what he meant. Right? And we'll see what that meant in a little bit. Now, let's talk about love being hard. Wow. I think all of us know love is not easy. If love was easy, man, there'd be no war. <laughs> there'd be no war, though. But love is hard. Why is love hard? Pride. Pride is huge, because if I hurt somebody's feelings, they now either anger me or hate me. If you, if you break somebody, they're going to not they'll hold against you your entire life. So love, true love, is not easy. So temptations, how they have played him at first when he was alone. So now, he's working. He's doing what Jesus said, repairing churches, but again, he sees his friends, he sees his father, he sees all the things he used to have, but he's alone. And how hard is it to be alone and to do good? Mm -hmm. How hard is it to be alone and to continue to do right? The greatest temptation was to feel sorry for himself and to ask himself why no one really cared about what he was doing. Yes, the lepers were grateful that he knew, but he could not expect from them the companionship he needed to sustain him in the service of them. So even though he had people around him, they didn't understand Christ the way he wanted to understand Christ, the way he was understanding Christ. Even though they were around him to preach everything, they were not there in service with him. They were receiving the service. So he felt extremely alone. Again, it goes back to us. If you here study spiritism, who can you study with? You didn't meet anyone here. Who can you speak about what you feel? Mm -hmm. Oh, I feel goosebumps. What does that mean? Oh, I thought I heard something. Can you relate to it? You have no one to speak to. What happens to yourself? You start thinking you're crazy. You start thinking, like, I don't want to hear. I don't know what's going on with myself. And then you fall apart. St. Francis was trying his best not to fall apart. He even prayed to God and to Jesus, please send me a companion. You yourself had 12 companions. Please don't leave me alone. I can't do this alone. So Francis lived in prayer, and he cast himself totally upon Jesus and begged him to let one poor man survive this test of selfishness. See, he kept, at every point in time, even though he doubted, mm -hmm. he still put his faith in Jesus. He understood he was human. He was making mistakes. But it's still to the very end, so when he thought he was going to give up, he still put his faith into Jesus. In his daily wash in the lepers, sores, Francis learned that love was hard, not soft and sentimental, as he guessed it would be. Every day he had to remind himself that he must discipline his own feelings if he was to become God's instrument. Love itself, he slowly grew to understand could be the demon in his heart. If by love, one understood a sweet, consoling feeling that ran over the heart and made it a little puddle of piety in the soul. Mm -hmm. So, it took me a couple times to really grasp that, right? What does love really mean? It means that, which is hard for me to understand too to this day, mm -hmm. if my son spits in my face and condemns me, and doesn't come back 10 years, should I hate him for it? Because that's what love is, to love the hardships that you're going to go through. To be able to still love each and every individual that offends you, hurts you, beats you, accuses you. And every day that they put you through that pain, 
and misery, that you still love him no matter what. And that's why he said that he had, had he finally understood that love was not meant to be easy. It's meant for us, it's meant to be hard. And that kind of demon was the hardest to root out because it looked and felt so much like real love. So that's the point, right? The point is, if you can't understand that love is hard and love is meant to be simple, well, guess what? Prepare to be hurt the rest of your life. Prepare to suffer every day. Prepare to always say, why this happened to me? Oh, woe is me, woe is me. Because why? Love is not meant to be simple. And if you keep thinking love is simple, and you will continue to suffer the day you leave this life and come to your self realization. You see, that was a portrait of Francis kissing a leper. Of being no longer alone. Hey, Leo, you okay? <laughs> Jesus. Sent a lifelong companion to Francis. His name was Bernard of Punta Valle. So Jesus heard his prayers not to leave him alone. Mm -hmm. So his first brother, true brother, Bernard of Punta Valle. Bernard of Punta Valle was like Francis, a rich merchant, but he had a humble heart. And one day he invited Francis in, seen him outside working in Benny. And during that night, Francis prayed the entire night. He thought Bernard was sleeping. What did Bernard do? He watched the entire night crying. So when he woke up, when Francis woke up in the morning, Bernard said, I want to renounce all my riches and come with you. For you did not know I was watching the entire night, but you brought me to what I know what I need to do in this life. This emptiness that I had every day, even though I had the most wealth, and even though I donated my funds, I was still empty. So that was his first and true brother. Francis was utterly stunned. Never in his wildest hopes had he imagined that God would so quickly answer his prayers for companionship and in poverty and pursuit of the dream. Wow. See, he put his faith in Jesus. Many of us, and I'm not, I can't count how many times the last that I pray and my wife says, babe, calm down, it's going to be okay. But I kept praying in the last minute. Things always, always turn out right. But I have to suffer first <laughs> for a little while. And I always feel that I must work hard. How many of us, to the last minute, keep praying, keep praying, and at the last minute, you see something beautiful happen? But how many of us give up in praying and don't see that light? How many of us suffer day to day because we are refusing to change who we are? We are refusing to make that inner transformation. And we still ask to this day, but why? I'm going to the spiritual center. I'm doing what I got to do. Are you? Are you really making that transformation internally? Because guess what? You can receive a pass here and there, but if you're not transforming who you are, what is that? What is that pass but a band-aid? Doesn't get ripped off immediately. Instead, Francis said that he must go together to the bishop's house, where there was a poor priest who would say mass with them. Afterward, they would ask the priest to open the book of the Gospels three times to see what God would there reveal to them about their future. Whether Bernard was to follow Christ as Francis' brother or not. Now look at this. He was so excited to have a new brother with him. First brother, actually. But he's still like, wait a second. I don't want to get too excited and then he leaves me. I don't want to get too excited and then I'm alone again. So I'm going to go to God again. So he goes to a nice priest to ask him to pick three random verses from the Bible. The verses were, if you wish to be perfect, go sell all your possessions and give to the poor and come and follow me. First verse. Take nothing for your journey, neither staff nor knapsack, shoes nor money. Third verse. Anyone who will come after me must renounce self, take up the cross and follow me. Now imagine how happy Francis was because mm -hmm. he wanted to live the life with Lady Poverty. Lady Poverty was his dream. His dream to live the life of Christ. <clears throat> and those three say it all. Give away everything. Follow me. Take nothing with you. Follow me. Renounce yourself. 
and follow me. That's exactly what he needed to hear to continue moving forward. And how many of us wish we had that uh, enlightenment? But guess what? Many of us get that enlightenment from day to day, but once we, once we get it, we ignore it. We don't want to hear it. No, no, that's, that's too hard. No, sorry. Right? But we get it. We're just like Francis. We get it. The only difference is that we don't want to accept it. That's the biggest difference. That was Francis praying, being watched. Now it's Francis and Bernadone. And, sorry, and the church. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We, um, receiving the three quotes of fear and comfort. So even though now he has friends with him, he has brothers, he's doing everything right, but he still has fear. Now, why would a man who renounced everything, has brothers, he's no longer alone, still have fear? Because Francis, everyone once in a while will fall, Francis, everyone once in a while will fall about the fear. Suddenly, as they rounded the little hill, they met one of his father's pack trains, returning from France, loaded with new cloth for the coming spring bazaar. Without warning, the fear gripped him, and he went empty and cold inside. Now, why? Think of it, right? Mm -hmm. He made his transformation, but now he's got a reminder of what his life used to be, mm -hmm. a reminder about his father's riches, a reminder of what he could have been. So even though he had the courage and all the changes that many of us cannot do, still, guess what? Fallible. He still realizes that I'm still weak. And that's one of the reasons why Francis made his inner change. This, 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 what people call fanatic inner change, is because he knew himself. How many of us know our weaknesses, but do nothing to combat them? How many of us know what we shouldn't be doing and instead of fighting the urge, still do it. Mm -hmm. But he knew his weaknesses. Brother Maceo, which is one, I think the second brother, was able to calm him down with a lullaby. So I know for a fact that we're never alone. Even though we feel alone, we're never alone. And there's somebody there to comfort us, whether in spirit or in person. We just have to accept that comfort. That shoulder. Francis did not, well, I already said this to you guys, but Francis did not like to be called good. He was happy to be called a sinner by his brothers. And this is why, because see this? Whereas his brother still thought he was perfect, he was the best, he started fear. So he knew, don't call me good. I am still a sinner. Sincerity of the heart and soul. On rainy days, Francis and his brothers would run into the city streets of Assisi and play around. The streets were always empty, but as soon as the rain would stop, the people would start to pour into the streets. And it was during these times where Francis felt he had truly chosen the correct path. Think about it. He goes out there when it's raining with his brothers. Nobody there to watch him. Nobody there to judge him. Right? As soon as the rain stops, all these windows open. All people see, and what they start doing immediately? Judge him. Ignore me. Francis had noticed from the beginning that when he went begging, especially very few people looked into his eyes. They seemed always to avoid eye contact, either from embarrassment or fears and contempt. Now, how many of us have come to terms with as a beggar or homeless person who comes to ask us for money and we see beer next to him? We look at him with contempt. Should we? But we do. How many of them are going to come asking us for food or money? And we don't do anything about it. And that's what happened to him. He saw at that moment the true sincerity of people's hearts and souls as being a beggar. That's when you know what a person truly is. You can have this friend of a church with you every week, but as soon as you see them from a beggar, you know who they are. There were, of course, the few bright-eyed, open people whose eyes were surely the lamps of their whole selves, radiating love and goodness and trust. It was marvelous how people became who they really were once you reached out your hand to them. And the gesture of the beggar, even the insight into people he had gained in his father's shop, paled when compared to what he learned begging in the streets of the sea. 
It's amazing how people treat you today. Imagine tomorrow if you were poor and you started asking for money. I started calling your family members and friends. Let's see how they would treat you. Let's see how you feel. So often the veneer of respectability would be slowed off and something like a monster would emerge, cursing and destroying you with a venom of words and gestures. It would experience only beggars understood. From these harrowing experiences, Francis determined to be always on the outside what he was on the inside. Francis feared duplicity and hypocrisy more than anything in the, all the world. It was against the hypocrisy that Jesus had railed again and again in the Gospels. So, he tried to practice every day of his life. And what you see on the outside is what you see in the inside. Right? Many of us could be wealthy, but be truly humble. At that point in time, most people who were wealthy were not humble. <laughs> right? But he didn't want you to see a rich, wealthy Franciscan. He wanted you to see a humble man. And he felt, because he was very literal, personal history, Francis was very, very literal, he felt that he must be poor on the outside, as poor as, poor as he was on the inside. Because Jesus said, poor. Poor in heart is humble. Fanaticism or inspired? Many people that day, and still scientists to this day, think that he was a fanatic, not inspired. Francis wanted to know what he was most, wait, Francis wanted to know that he was most not himself one of these preachers whose preaching was more self serving than inspired. So he started to reflect on who he was and says, Am I one of those fanatics that go across the country praising a God and I'm doing this for me? I'm actually doing this for Christ. Mm -hmm. Is this my ego, now, or is this, or is this really what I'm doing? So Francis said, "Let's go to Rome. Let's go to Pope." So he took his brothers with him to Rome in order to get the approval of the Pope at that time, Pope Innocent the Third. So he he went and met the Pope, asking for basically his blessings to start this organization of brothers. But the Pope, being somewhat kind of a skeptic and fanatics, right? He was like, he saw them. He said, like, "No, I'm not going to tell them no right now. Let me sleep on it." So the same night, the Pope met with Francis. He dreamed that the Church of Saint John Lateran, the mother church of Christendom, began to lean on its side and topple to the ground. Then, just as the church was crashing to the ground, a little beggar. Leap from the shadows to support the falling building on his own shoulders. So now he woke up. He was like, okay, I know what I'm supposed to do right now. You know, everybody's saying, don't let them start their own little chapter. I'm going to let them because I received the vision I needed. This little beggar was the one that's going to support the church and the soldiers. So when Jesus said, go and repair my church, same vision Pope Innocent III had. He was holding the church on his shoulders. Because he's repairing true faith. See, Francis wasn't wasn't big into scholars. He wasn't big into intellects. He wasn't big about you know everyone being studious. What he was big into, love, morality, change, reformation of the inside. Because he feared intellect. Well, as time goes and today, intelligence is beautiful, it's awesome. Right? Because spiritism teaches us that with intellect and, uh, and love and morality, we have a perfect union. But at that point in time, it was like, no, don't, don't be scholars. Don't be like the Pharisees. Don't be like the, the bishops of that time who were like very pomp. Right? No. Be humble. Loving. Easy or difficult matter. Now, during, the, during my research of St. Francis, Francis always, and by me always, <laughs> Took the most difficult path. If one fast him straight and narrow, and the other one curved, he took the curve. He just had to. Because that's how he understood the gospel. He understood that the gospel was not being easy. So he he felt as literal as he was, he must put the gospel, the translation of not being easy, into his day-to-day -day life. Not just being poverty, not just being homeless, but taking the hardest path possible. At every fork in the road, there was a narrow, difficult way and a wide and easy way to travel. Still, at every road, 
the easier way attracted him with almost a hypnotic persuasion. Again, it wasn't perfect. Why? This is why he kept saying, do not call me good. He knew he had to change. And that's why he chose a difficult path. Because he felt by choosing this difficult path every single time, mm -hmm. he was going to learn something. He was become more humble, more understanding. Something good was going to happen during this difficult path. And how many of us could say that? that when we go through hardships, we actually learn from it. When we go through hardships, and actually something good comes out of it. When we take the easy path, not always. He never took the easy road, not because he wanted to punish himself or the brothers, but because that is the way he read the gospel. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of difficult obstacles in your path. Don't allow yourself to become one of them. And that is our biggest problem, isn't it? That we are our worst obstacle. Our worst enemy. Right? We are the worst obstacle we have, man. We want to do the right thing, but our pride says otherwise. Our selfishness says otherwise. Our anger says otherwise. Okay. Everything that we want to do right always says otherwise. Because it's not easy being good. It's not easy trying to be good. So not even being good, trying. Just, just the act of, of, of making that change is not easy. Easy way or the hard way. So look at this man. He's crawling across a mountain. How many of us would do that? I want to. I don't gotta do it. I, don't, I want to. Right? But at the end of it, I'm sure he gained some enlightenment. Whether it's some inner reform, inner research, he gained something out of it. Now, this is really small for you guys to be. I'm sorry if you're not realizing it's this small. So I'll, I'll read it to you. Um, for those of you who haven't read the Gospel according to Spiritism, at the end of it is a bunch of prayers. One of the best prayers is the Our Father. But is the Our Father explained according to Spiritism? This is the Our Father explained according to St. Francis. Our Father, most holy, our Creator and Redeemer, our Savior and our Comforter, who are in heaven, together with the angels and the saints, give them light so they may have knowledge of you because you, Lord, are light, inflaming them so that they may love because you, Lord, are love, living continually in them and filling them so that they may be happy because you, Lord, are the supreme good, the eternal good, and it's from you that all good comes. And without you, there is no good. Hallowed be thy name. May our knowledge of you become ever clearer. Say that we may realize the width and breadth of your blessings, the steadfastness of your promises, the sublimity of your majesty, and depth of your judgments. Thy kingdom come, so that you may reign in us by your grace and bring us to your kingdom, where you will see you clearly, love you perfectly, be blessed in your presence, and enjoy you forever. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, so that we may love you with our whole heart, by always thinking of you, directing our whole intention with our whole mind towards you, and seeking your glory in everything, spending all our powers and affection of soul and body with all our strength in the service of your love alone. May we also love our neighbors and ourselves, encourage them to love you as best as we can, rejoicing at the good fortune of others, just as it is for our own, and sympathizing with their misfortunes, <coughs> giving offense to no one. Give us this day our daily bread. Your own beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, so to remind us of the love He showed for us and to help us understand and appreciate it in everything that He did or said or suffered. And forgive us our trespasses. In your infinite mercy, by the power of the passion of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, together with the merits and the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, all your saints, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And if we do not forgive perfectly, Lord, make us do so so that we may indeed love our enemies out of our love for you and pray fervently to you for them, never returning evil for evil, anxious only to serve everybody in you. And lead us not into temptation, neither hidden or obvious, sudden or unforeseen, but deliver us from evil, present, past, or to come. Amen. 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 That's the end of part one. Francis. I guess I'll pray ourselves. Yeah. Uh, that was our prayer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of neat, right? We know about that about St. Francis. 
No, we always have the parent. Yeah. Sorry, I should have said that. 